few months ago, I had the pleasure of introducing my children to Xena Warrior Princess. There are many joys to be had as a parent, not all of them grown up. For all that the moral core of parenthood is sacrifice, having children also gives us an excuse to play with toys, to revisit lost worlds and remember our heroes of long ago and far away. I was particularly anxious that my daughter be introduced to Xena as she had begun studying jujitsu at my insistence. By the time she's old enough to date, she's like, she's 10 right now. So by the time she's old enough to date in about 30 or 40 years, I am determined she will leave the house as an unstoppable killing machine. <laughs> Having spent extra time outside the dojo on her training, I was curious to see if she was advanced enough in her understanding of the art to break down the fight scenes in Xena for me, to explain which techniques the warrior princess had chosen and why, especially if the techniques the choreographers chose were ill-advised, such as responding to an overhead stab with a shoulder throw. Do you know why you don't do that? Because if you turn inside the th line of the stab for the throw and you trip, which you almost certainly will in real life, you'll fall over <coughs> onto the knife. You don't do it. I am pleased to report her unstoppable killing machine skills are coming along very well. <coughs> as the father of a 10-year-old girl, of course, I have an interest in such things, but also as a writer. Having my ass handed to me more than once in sparring sessions over the years. I have no illusions at all about the ability of a woman to use force when properly trained and possessed of the will to act. I also have a very clear memory of seeing a practice fight at a martial arts tournament come to a sudden end when a male martial artist foolishly walked into a spinning back kick by a woman on whom he had at least 20 kilograms and four or five inches of reach. Spinning back kicks aren't even supposed to work, not in real life, but the sick wet crunch of her heel striking his jawline and the marvellously cinematic arc described by at least half a dozen of his teeth as they flew through the air tell me otherwise. For a long time I played Uki or attacker to a jiu-jitsu sensei called Mark Haseman, who was my teacher. We taught a basic self-defence class for schoolgirls. Eight weeks, which didn't so much teach them how to deal with a strangle or a straight punch as it taught them to understand that they could deal with such a thing if they trained long enough and hard enough. I believed it then and I believe it now. All things being equal, there is absolutely no reason for a woman to feel as though she has to go through life as a potential victim. Of course, that was in the world of real things and we're here to talk about the unreal and the fantastic, but I think it helps if we get this out of the way. Women can kick ass, and arguably the world would be a better place if they did more of it. Thank you. Like many of you, I'm guessing, I spent a lot of time as a kid in front of screens big and small. There were certain shows and movies which drew me back time and again. Doctor Who, Star Trek, Lost in Space, a whole slew of westerns and war movies and the occasional horror flick. Although I was a bit of a wussy boy in that respect and spent a good deal of time either staring fixedly just above the screen when watching a vampire movie or shamefully hiding behind the couch while Doctor Who was menaced by store dummies or space lizards. Even as a child, however, I knew not to place too much faith in the Doctor's assistants, not the lady ones anyway, although, God, you know, looking back, the blokes weren't much better. Sarah Jane Smith, in particular, had but one defence to alien attack, which was to fly to pieces so quickly that the jagged shards of hysterical sidekick would take out every threat within 25 yards. <laughs> it was only when the doctor finally took up with the female warrior, Leela of the Sever Team, a sort of proto Xena, that we finally had a female companion who didn't redefine a new global standard in lame. Leela did not scream unless it was a battle cry. She did not fall over unless it was part of some elaborate sacrifice throw. And her instinctive response to threat was to draw her knife and start looking for livers to cut out. 
The poor doctor was forced to invest almost as much time in restraining her as he was in seeing off the Dalek hordes she was intent on bashing to scrap metal with a big rock. I don't know about you, but for me it was like a glorious dawn. Perhaps because I was getting to an age where I noticed that Leela's leather skirts were shorter than anything Sarah Jane or Joe Grant had worn, and that she stepped out in much more interesting boots. But mostly because he was a female character who, for once, didn't induce eye-rolling and face-palming every time she shared the screen with a giant maggot or killer daffodil. I understand that there were female action heroes before Leela, but I wasn't old enough to have seen Emma Peel in The Avengers or Pussy Galore in Goldfinger. I hadn't been much impressed by George from The Famous Five, who arguably had it all. Mad leadership skills, a determination not to take shit from any stupid boys, a properly aligned moral compass, a love of dogs, and enough smarts to wear a sensible knit jumper when it was cold out. <laughs> And her American contemporaries seemed little better, all sensibly dressed do-gooders and busybodies like Nancy Drew and Trixie Belden, neither of whom ever snapped a guy's neck clean off, as far as I can remember, or fashioned a homemade flamethrower to weaponize a big ass-kicking suit of powered armor like Ripley's in the second Alien movie. Indeed, it's probably Ripley we have to thank, not just for updating the image of the female hero in mass culture, but for completely re-engineering it. While Ridley Scott did indulge himself in one gratuitous booty shot in the first instalment of the Alien Saga, Sigourney Weaver's character was unusual for being strong and feminine, but not sexualized. There never arises the issue of love interest, partly because any suitable partners quickly have their brains punched out by the alien's extendable dentures or their chest cavities ripped apart by eyeless little booger demons implanted in their tummies. The only real love interest for Ripley is her cat and Newt, the small girl in the second film, who allows Weaver's character to grow maternally without the encumbrance of a father figure. The line, get away from her, you bitch, was significant not just because it was awesome, and it was, but because it marked the moment when mass culture announced that a showdown between two women over the future of a child was a worthy topic not just for some obscure dialogue-driven character study from the outer wastes of art house cinema, but for epic narrative spanning star systems and lit with the bright white light of an antimatter core meltdown that explodes like collapsing neutron stars across the face of the culture. Even so, with Ripley ceding some ground in awesomeness to the dirtier, more downbeat, but heroically sapphic and muscular charms of Vasquez in Aliens 2, even with Thelma and Louise accelerating away over the existential edge of male-imposed limits and a really big cliff, even with Tank Girl and Elestra busting chops in graphic novel form, there was a long way to go until we reach Buffy. We all love Buffy. Joss Whedon's avowedly feminist project to create a female hero who subverted the dominant paradigm of, and I'm quoting Whedon, the little blonde girl who goes into a dark alley and gets killed in every horror film. The significance of Buffy is not her superpowers, but her ordinary nature. I know that sounds odd. Allow me to continue. In Buffy, we found a female action hero, a true action hero, who would think nothing of reverse spin kicking a vampire's chops clear across the room. But more importantly, in the character's creation mythology, we find an average suburban girl to begin with, a cheerleader who loves parties and dancing and shopping, who has problems at school, both academic and eventually demonic, problems with boys, living and undead, and a close circle of friends without whom she would most probably and quite literally die. Buffy was important because she was modern. Unlike the sort of girl who survives through to the last reel of most slasher flicks, she is not chaste and androgynous. She doesn't die because she has sex. She has sex and then she kicks monster butt. Sometimes, well, more often than not, actually, she falls for the bad boy. But unlike so many female protagonists before her, if the bad boy gives her too much grief, she stabs him in the heart and kicks his worthless ass into a hell dimension. Buffy would have no truck with 
sparkly vampires or mooning after pale-skinned Byronic nuff-nuffs like Edward Cullen, she would just stake the little gimp. <laughs> of course, in doing so, and loving her for doing so, we suddenly get into the contested realm of violence, and it's here that many women and men part company in their hero choices. It's interesting for the most part that the, the most recent Iron Man iteration had no explanation or extended backstory thought necessary to explain Scarlett Johansson's ability to destroy waves of attackers with kinetic grace. We just accept she can. The same way we accept that Karen Thrace in the rebooted Battlestar Galactica can outshoot outdrink and outfuck any man she meets. For Starbuck, however, there is an emotional price to pay for vaulting over that gender grab. She is a realistic hero in that sense. My friend and fellow writer, Oren Thomas, whom you will find bit-parted in After America, suggests that a preference for realism is an unbridgeable gender gap when thinking about action heroes. That perhaps women don't glom onto superhero archetypes, not just because of the rather male-oriented way they're portrayed in media such as comics, but also because women tend to prefer their heroes to be what he calls relatable archetypes, whereas men look for more aspirational archetypes. What does that fucking mean? Well, Ripley works because she's not extraordinary in any way other than that she deals with a crisis which is beyond everybody else in the office, male, female or android. Batman just kicks ass all the time. Men like female heroes who are aspirational and extraordinary, who give them something to live up to or aspire to. But the same heroes may, may put off a female audience simply because those aspirations are unrealistic in a normal person. Put another way, his tentative thesis is that men like unrealistic heroes and women like heroes who are believable and whose feats may even be achievable. A reader who visits my blogs under the screen name of Catty agreed without even realising she was doing so because she made this comment in an entirely separate thread. Most female action heroes, she said, are totally unrealistic ideals for girls to aspire to. Most of us are physically, emotionally and socially unable to achieve such awesomeness, she thought. Even if we do, it doesn't last. For example, a mate of mine, I'm speaking as Catty now, studied karate, she kicked ass, exclamation mark, competed in the world championships and everything, and she was drop dead gorgeous. Then she got married. Her husband's career had far greater earning potential than her job as a sales girl, so she stays home. 40 kilos later, she's not so gorgeous, and with three kids, she no longer has the time for karate. This, said Catty, is the reality for most women, and that's why Barbara is popular. Who? Well, when Without Warning came out, there was two really kick-ass female characters in it, two characters that I had specifically put in there for the reason, the same reason that Whedon had. There was a paradigm and I wanted to subvert it. It was Caitlin Munro, who was this assassin killing machine, really awesome, and there was Jules, who was a fallen daughter of the British aristocracy and a smuggler. They were different, and I'll get to how they were in a moment, but for me, they were, they were the heroes of that book. There was another character, Barbara Kipper, who was the wife of James Kipper, an engineer who eventually ends up, like, you know, saving America. Barbara was there primarily because I wanted Kipper to have a home life and also because I needed somebody to describe the scenes in Seattle. It was that calculating. The thing I found kind of fascinating and a little bit upsetting when I asked readers of the first book about a month after it came out, which one do you like most, expecting a big sort of, you know, Jules v. Caitlin smackdown to ensue, was that most of the male readers liked Barbara. Barbara who? I don't know. What, um, what Catty thought about Barbara is that she was someone who ordinary women could aspire to, someone we can emulate. Unlike Caitlin, who is some sort of freak, all she does is make us resentful and jealous. We don't like Caitlin because she is everything we can never, ever be. She's a bitch. 
What women want, again, this is Catty, is the princess who outwits the dragon and rescues herself, the Rapunzel who climbs down her own hair and buggers off before Witchy Poo comes back. We don't want someone with special powers or physical prowess. We want an ordinary woman who can survive by her wits in extraordinary situations. So all you need to do is amalgamate Nigella Lawson and MacGyver and voila! <laughs> Your women readers will be happy. Some of the men, too. But what would I know, she asks. I am just a woman. Another reader, Abigail from Canberra, thought Barbara Kipper's mum type was appealing because she was soft. Harsh, rough women aren't universally attractive, she said. I personally don't relate to hard, violent women at all, whether on paper or in real life, because they just feel like redrawn men to me. And then only within a narrow spectrum of maleness anyway. My female action heroes, and this is Abigail, are normally less action and more heroine. For example, the Gina Davis character from Muriel, the accidental tourist. I don't recall Gina Davis pulling anyone's head off in that movie. <laughs> and Precious Ramotze from the number one ladies detective agency. I know they're not the kinds of women you're talking about, John, but my point is that it's what's about what's inside them and what is subtly projected by them in every scene and chapter. The internal strength, which is hardly ever mentioned, that's what's attractive, not their martial arts skills. It was an interesting comment, but it did raise the issue of whether you can have an action hero, male or female, who doesn't do action, <laughs> who doesn't do violence. I don't think you can, but that doesn't mean that all the action and all the violence in these stories has to come down to one huge, undifferentiated blood swarm. In both Without Warning and After America, I was unusually careful, by my standards, to make sure there was a real difference between Jules and Caitlin's fight scenes. Caitlin is a killing machine. She has been trained and honed as a weapon for more than 10 years. So although she uses weapons, she herself is one. And we see that in her opening fight scene in Without Warning, where, surprised, unarmed, in hospital with a really undignified gown out of which her ass is hanging, she fights barehanded. She kills an attacker with a bedpan. When she fights, she doesn't trade blows. She is, after all, almost always fighting other trained killers, usually men, and she cannot afford to give away any advantages in height, weight, or reach. Instead, her attacks are not cinematic. They are always short and vicious, targeting vulnerable points in any attempt to cripple and then very quickly kill her opponent as soon as possible. Jules, on the other hand, is not a trained fighter. She is a daughter of the British aristocracy. She's also a bitch. Not that I don't like her for it. She always has a weapon to hand because she knows she will need it sometime soon. The other thing that Jules has, and this is crucial, is will. The will to hurt someone, to kill them, is more important than having the means in both real life and in fiction. I was determined in writing these books that the two most awesome, violent, kick-ass characters in them would be women. And in Caitlin, by book two, not just a woman, but a nursing mother. Partly because of a quip someone made on my Facebook page that new mothers would make perfect assassins. They're used to sneaking around in the dark, not stepping on squeaky things, and they're really, really cranky. <laughs> Cross them and they will totally put a bullet in your brain. I was also determined, however, that I didn't want to create superheroes. Caitlin, in particular, would trend towards Wonder Woman status, and thus it was necessary to impose limits on her. In Without Warning, those limits come in the form of a brain tumour. In After America, she has mummy guilt. Jules, on the other hand, is constrained more by her nature than her circumstances. A daughter of the nobility, she was raised by a father who was an infamous fraudster, a man whose wanton squandering of the family fortune saw her as the first generation of her family in over a thousand years to lose the real estate. She is a smuggler and a thief, someone who almost ends up doing the right thing for the wrong reasons. And that's actually where I ran out of time. 
One of the questions I've been asked on this tour again and again, and I'm not sure why, is about the war between genre and literature. I don't believe there is a war between genre and literature. I think there's a war between reading and the Nintendo DS, but not between genre and literature. But I can understand why people ask that question. They assume that as soon as a book reaches a sort of critical mass of explosions and gunfights and guys getting their heads snapped off at the neck, that it, it must be crap and it must be missing out on like all of the lovely like internal nuances that you get in true literature. And you know, yes, I get it. I do spend three pages describing how Caitlin puts the silencer on her pistol and not very long at all about how she feels about it. <laughs> but that doesn't mean that, you know, you have to do completely two-dimensional characters and you have to do completely, like, you know, cardboard cutout scenes. You don't when you're doing these, these sorts of books. I, I got into these books because they were fun to do. Uh, in fact, I got into them by accident. I, when I was doing the research for Leviathan, I was in the library four and a half years, and uh, you know it was dull. I was, at one point, I was researching sand dune movement in Surrey Hills in the the 1800s. They had a royal commission into it, and um, like in those days, that when they had royal commissions, they 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 took the testimony and it's like it's all there, like just page after page after page, people talking about sand dunes. And I was reading this when um, I just, I, I needed a break. And so I started uh, playing around with an idea for a, a big, dumb airport novel, just never intending to actually write it. Word leaked out. And um, next thing I knew, I had Americans on the phone, you know, oh, hi, John, uh, we've heard about this book. Uh, uh, you know, you got an aircraft carrier from the future and it goes, it goes back in time, is that right? And it uh, kicks Hitler's ass, oh my God. I, uh, <laughs> And they got lesbians on this ship kicking Hitler's ass. I mean, Hitler's ass getting kicked by lesbians. I mean, uh, that's gold, buddy. Like, uh, have you uh, have you got uh, have you, how many lesbians? How many you got these lesbians finished? Or what? Can I can I get a hold of this manuscript? And, and I said, Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, do you want a trilogy? It's awesome. <laughs> so yes, I ended up as a thriller writer by accident. But it, it turned out to be much more fun than doing. Sand dunes in Surrey Hills. When I lived down here, I, I really, I, I truly believe you cannot write these books unless you live in the city that you're, you're writing about. You, you have to be able to, to walk the streets you're writing about, and you have to, to be able to feel the, the ghosts under your feet. I, I got to the point uh, in the, the last year of doing Leviathan. I was in the library every day, as I said, and I used to, to walk there because I lived in the inner city. And, and part of the process of walking there was to actually feel the history of the place pressing in on me from every side. And I, I knew so much about it by then, because you know, I was on the, the job 10 hours a day, pretty much six days a week, that it, it, I would see the various cities that had been there before, because all, all cities grow and, and go through various phases, and, and Sydney, uh, much more so than, than Melbourne, is a city which has eaten itself over and over again. And you know, I would look at some nasty, aesthetically worthless rent slabs sitting on you know one corner, but I would actually see the sort of gracious neo-Georgian gentleman's club that had been there. 20 years earlier and then on the the other corner you know I, I might see the showgirl who had been you know murdered by some callous cad who had come out from the UK and uh, I remember going to the pub one day in the rocks I think it was like the hero of Waterloo which is the second oldest hotel in the city which is pretty old and I was sitting there drinking my beer just sort of looking out when all of a sudden the street sort of rearranged itself in my imagination I, I suddenly realized that directly across from this pub I was looking at a vacant plot of land where a, a, a sad little shack had stood in 1901 and in that shack had lived uh, a warehouseman who had been the first person in Sydney to contract the plague and die from it he'd sort of he'd gone into um, work that morning he'd been bitten by a flea or something felt a bit unwell which in those days you know he, you didn't just leave because you had the lurgy. You had to feel pretty crook. Got himself home, sat down on his cot, died 
and it was just across from the pub. And of course, it was part of the history of the city that had been lost, just forgotten. And I really, Melbourne would be exactly the same, um, even more so because your city has not eaten itself over and over again in the same way that Sydney has. I've thought about it. I've actually have thought about doing it, but it would mean relocating down here for three or four years, which I'm not averse to because you know, it's a fantastic city. But I'd have to um, have to convince the wife, mate. I'm quite Victorian in, uh, in, in some ways. Like our kids are restricted in the amount of screen time they have. It, it's odd for someone who, you know, like me, who just gobbles up electronic media and, and games. I have all three gaming systems. I, I love playing games, but as a wretched games addict myself, I, I know how completely powerful they are and how they can overwhelm the urge to read, particularly in kids. I, I think one of the saddest things I, I've ever seen when my kids get together with, you know, their, their age peers is, you know, the Nintendos yeah, come out yeah, and within can. four or five minutes you've got these zombies just sitting around and playing with these things. Like, it, it's, it's very, um, it's, it's depressing, so. What, was I killed them all? No. Um, <laughs> Uh, they were surprisingly cool about that because, uh, you know, some of them survived and they all very arrogantly assumed that, you know, well, you know I, I, that, that would totally be me. I, I would be the guy who lives and kicks ass. Yeah, rockin'. Um, the, the thing that... I, I do get upset Americans uh, because the, the, there's a lot of... Um, I have no backstory in the US. You know, I, I, I haven't published falafel in the US. I, I don't work as a... a a columnist or a satirist over there, and so they, the American readers don't necessarily get the fact that the books, besides being you know, action adventures, are also satires. And you would think that in, say, the Weapons of Choice novel, where the aircraft carrier <coughs> is called the USS Hillary Clinton, <laughs> named after the most uncompromising <laughs> wartime president in US history, <laughs> that perhaps I'm taking the piss, but uh, no. When, <laughs> when that book came out, I got a lot of angry, you know, sort of pre-Tea Party nutbags <laughs> harassing me online. How dare you, sir? How dare you put that troll and that socialist harridan in charge of our country <laughs> and name an aircraft carrier after her? It's just <clears throat> genuine rage crazy people. Um, so that's the stuff they get upset about that and, and getting things wrong, um, like micro deeds. That's the funny thing about these books, like, you know, they, they have big, dumb ideas. Not so much with the, uh, the thrillers, although I like to play loud, thrashy music when I, I write them, but um, with the, the indie novels, you know, Falafel and, and Babes, uh, and, and even to a lesser extent with um, uh, how to be a man, um, there were lots and lots of uh, references to what at that stage was cutting edge music and is now considered, you know, very quaint and, and grey haired. And the, the nice thing about music, but it, it's also a trap, is that um, by, by threading music and, and, and references to music through work like that, you. Um, you give them a sort of aesthetic depth that they, they don't you know, necessarily have. Otherwise, you, um, you set the scene with much richer tones. But what you also do, of course, is date the work immediately. So if you read uh, Falafel now, um, I mean, some of the, the bands you, like, you, know, you, you might not get because they were, they were hyper-obscure. Um, you know, anybody here remember the mutant shitbags? <laughs> no, I didn't think so. But, um, you know, you, maybe you could get away with pretending they were still playing now, but uh, it's, you know, references to, to more mainstream stuff, you, you can't. And so I've actually, um, I've been a little more careful about using music since then. Although having said that, um, one of the thing, one of the great things about these books is you can get um, caught up in the researching the minutiae and um, 
I, just, I became obsessed a while ago after doing Without Warning with the idea of finding out which American bands were on tour when the wave hit <laughs> because, you know, then I would be able to give them new albums because otherwise the music everyone listened to the book would be stuck back in you know, 2002 or whatever it was. And uh, it was one of those occasions where, um, you know, the interwebs defeated me. It was actually really difficult to, to get, like, you know, a, a, a fan of a band might have known whether they toured in, in 2003, but, but actually locating that information turned out to be really hard. Although I'm sure if I tweeted up an inquiry, I would get a, um, a response back pretty quickly.